Chapter 26 Negotiating in Practice With that traumatic situation dealt with, Ori found himself in the back of Max's car as he drove with Six and Shotgun. Max had apparently already planned everything out and was just waiting on Ori to make the final decision. For some reason, next to Ori was the damp plastic bag which held Speck's head, the proof they'd need to convince Quentin Fabrosi to work with them. If revenge wasn't a good enough motivator for the young man, then fear that they'd do the same to him would probably tip him over the proverbial edge. Kid, Max asks, holding an open pack of SIG over his shoulder as he drives. Relax? Ori reaches for one of them, only then realizing that his hands were trembling. Y -ya. Thanks. He lights the SIG up and looks out the window, his eyes turning upwards to the skyscrapers that were steadily approaching. Was it strange that this was the first time he'd been anywhere near the center of Night City? It looked incredible but he knew that was only to accommodate the greedy suits that lived and worked there. Why else would the rest of Night City basically be giant slums? Max drives around the outskirts of downtown until they reach an underground car park. He shows the security guards some sort of identification and they drive in, parking an isolated corner at the second to last floor of the car park that overlooked some streets on the outskirts of Wellspring. What now? Ori questions as Max and Six begin making themselves comfortable. We wait, see if this Quentin kid want to show or not. Said he'll be here but anything can happen. All right, Ori mutters, his eye twitching when he remembered that he was sitting next to a severed head in a bag. Beep beep. Yo, Ori, I know you are probs busy and all but I need to ask you something. Judy, and what is it? Oi. Video received. Ori opens the file and blanks out momentarily. It was a recording of his fight with that chrome jock yesterday. The one he'd almost gotten zeroed in. It was placed outside of Darren's apartment and showed everything from that perspective. The man's men getting gunned down from inside. Him stepping in then Ori's battle with the guy afterwards. It showed him getting slammed into the ceiling, then his awkward moments when the Nainites took over, firing pinpoint accurate shots from the pistol to bring the jock down, finally finishing him off with a shotgun to the face. He was incredibly thankful that the cam hadn't been able to get a clear shot of his face. His jacket's hood had gotten caught on the sparking Skav hollow mask, keeping it up even after all the damage he'd taken. It felt incredibly odd looking at it like this, an almost surreal experience. Was this you? Judy. And what do you think? Oi. Dumb. I know it's you. Judy. You are mistaking me for someone else. Oi. Tongue sticking out, tongue sticking out, you are wearing the same old shoes and pants you wore when you met me. Plus, you are exactly the same height as the guy in the vid, Judy. And what if I was? That a problem? Oi. Ah. No way. Ufalatin tasin. Leader of the Safe K crew. You flatlined almost the entire gang. That's a big fukin deal, 11. Tasin. Oi. A rising merc who took control of a district in Watson. Big asshole. Huge in fact. Like to take advantage of the fams that live there. Still forced to pay protection money as well. I told Q about him but she said it was out of their hands. You are lucky to be alive TBH. That guy was almost fully borged with albeit crap tier cyberware. There was a reason he didn't just run and stomp you or face a no. Huh. Well thank fuck he ran into the snail merc then. Hang. Couldn't he have just run away then? Beep beep. Besides. This was sent to me by someone we know. You got Rebecca's attention now. She's still texting me about how fucking Nova that was. Judy, that wasn't good. If Rebecca could recognize him, then who else could? Who else knows? Oi. Just me and Rebecca. She only recognized you because of your wimpy lamppost figure, or whatever. I managed to scrub the other cameras that caught you our face, but this vid is already making it around the net. Judy. So I should expect a call from Rebecca then? Oi. XDXD. No, between you and me, she doesn't want to look desperate and needy. So she'll probs hit you up in a week or two, probs with a gig to go with it. Don't tell her we talked about this, she's annoying enough with the ammo. Judy. Right, Ori. Oh, before I forget. As thanks for dealing with the shit the mocks should have been in the first place, Judy. Plus 3,000. Ain't much but that's for my personal stash. Three less than three, Judy. Thanks. Let me know if you need anything else. Let's leave out the board guys though, I need a break from that shit, Ori. He finishes and shoves the holophone into his pocket then quickly spots a lone man in a corpo suit slowly and stiffly walking towards them. Yo, is that him? Max and Six look over, both nodding, yeah, should be. Six stay in the car, kid bring the bag, and keep your mouth shut. Don't need to tell me twice, this is your plan. Ori shrugs and steps out, the suit stopping a couple meters away from the car. He had light tan skin with short-cut black hair that left his fringe long enough to hang. He had visible cyberware around his head and temple, but nothing indicating any real combat modification. Ori was hopeful he wouldn't need to fight anyone like Taxine anytime soon. You Max? The man, probably in his early twenties asks. Muxnolch, yeah, Gauta. MHM, got your message, any of that true? Have you heard back from any of your buddies? 
should answer your question, Max calmly retorts, keeping his hands where the guy could see them. None are responding. I've got calls from their families. He solemnly utters. I saw the messages between the fixer and my father. Got proof? Max smiles grimly and nods at Ori, who empties the bag onto the ground, allowing Speck's severed head to fall with a wet thud. He gives it a slight kick, pushing it towards the quickly paling Quentin. That enough proof for you? Alan Pretcher, Specs, guy who your father called to assassinate your buddies. Quentin takes a while to recover his composure, obviously used to handling the gorier aspects of society. You want something from me, then? He asks questioningly, his brows tightly knitted burgeoning anger towards his father. We want Eddie's, you want revenge. I'm sure we can come to a deal. Max states, folding his arms. Quentin stands there silently for a minute or two, before eventually coming to a decision. Fine. I'm in. Talk to me. Okay. Chapter 27. Downtown Joyride. The group's initial meeting with Quentin went rather well. He was totally on board as soon as they laid out exactly what his father had done, while also keeping away the fact that they'd been the ones to carry most of it out. It honestly felt incredibly sinister for Ori, like attending the funeral of a man you personally killed. Still, he knew better than to air his thoughts. Quentin may just be a young corpo, but once his father was dead he'd inherit quite a lot from everything they'd heard. Cleveland Fabrosi was one of the head scientists that worked in Biotechnica, someone important in his field with many connections both within and outside of Biotechnica itself. It was because of this that the man was so difficult to reach. Any other merc would have been hard-pressed to find any information pertaining to him, his schedule, accommodations, workplace, etc. Not to mention the security Biotechnica have assigned to him. Thankfully, Quentin was their key through all of that. The Corpo probably never expected his son to start conspiring against him, which is how the group found themselves where they are now, sitting in their car outside the hidden back exit of the Biotechnica Hotel. It was essentially just a bit of flatland in an alleyway, which when activated allowed the floor to open up and raise a car out of the underground parking lot of the hotel. Quentin was there, leaning against one of the dark, grimy walls with his arms folding, waiting for his father to arrive. Ori and Max were posted a good distance away, looking through a link connecting them to six eyes the merc sitting camouflaged not far from Quentin's position. Think this'll work? It looks suspect even to me, let alone a fully specked out security team. Ori mutters to Max. Kid, we're downtown, in the center of Corpocuntopia. No one other than Cybus Psychos has the balls to go anywhere near this place, let alone try to kidnap a bigwig. If Quentin was being held hostage or forced to do this, they'd have known almost instantly. But him working with us willingly? They'll overlook it. The vet states. There. Max utters as the alleyway begins shifting, the floor opening up to reveal a hidden elevator lifting a car into view. A shovel in Thrax 388, Jefferson comes into view, Cleveland Fabrosi sitting comfortably in the back with his chauffeur at the wheel. They drive forward to allow the elevator to return and Cleveland rolls the window down as the car stops near Quentin. Get closer so we can hear him. Max orders Six, who does so, invisibly stepping beside Quentin. What's this all about, son? You call me out of the blue and ask me to have a chat in private? Is the hotel not a good enough venue for you? Or is there something else on your mind? The heavy set, balding man asks his son. Quentin pushes himself off of the wall and scowls at him. This is something better left unheard to outsiders. A family matter. He glances at the chauffeur. Something about my friends. Cleveland's eyes widen minutely at that and he nods. Ah, then, let's speak about this somewhere private then dash. Sir, I shall have your security prepared. Night City is no place to go without protection. The chauffeur offers. Cleveland pauses in thought, causing Ori to panic slightly. A full corpo security would basically ruin their plan. If Toxion was hard for him now, fighting a security team all better equipped than him would basically be a death sentence, even with Max and Six with him. I told you, this is a family matter. Quentin growls, accidentally letting his hostility bubble over, causing Cleveland's face to turn suspicious. This is going cock up. Six. Mux whispers. Quentin opens the door of the car, but before he enters, Six sits himself inside. Next to Cleveland, his invisible body unseen by the chauffeur, but for Cleveland? Click. The sound of a hammer cocking next to his ear caused his entire body to freeze up. Listen to your boy, or I'm recording your car. Six rasps a whisper, pressing the barrel of his revolver against the man's cheek slightly. His skin rapidly pales, the cool feeling of metal causing him to blink rapidly. Quentin sits down and shuts the door, ignoring his leg brushing against Six. Let's get this over with, shall we? Dad dot. He offers subduedly. Sir? The chauffeur questions, noticing his boss's strange reaction. Why yes, let's go shall we? And my son clearly has something important to discuss. He stutters out, only managing to move his mouth, fearing that the invisible weapon in his face would fire abruptly. As you wish? 
Max shuts the laptop and starts up the car as their target begins driving. Buckle up, kid. If we get stopped now for you not wearing your seatbelt, I'll drive over your head myself. He grouses. How long does six camouflage have left? Ori questions, not knowing the extent of the cyberware. Don't know. He's probably overclocking his shit to keep it running. He'll need a rest and shitload of immunoblockers once this is finished if I had to guess. The target's car drives through the city center and only stops when it reaches an isolated underground parking lot near one of the markets. Max drives in after them, of course. The chauffeur immediately notices this since no one else should be arriving there. That didn't matter, however, as six body appears and blows a hole into the back of the man's head, covering the front windscreen in blood and gray matter. Cleveland immediately begins panicking, but Six just throws him out of the car as Quentin follows. Esson. What is this? Why are you doing this? Cleveland asks he stumbles away, clutching a pillar and resting his weight against it as Six circles him like a shark who caught the scent of blood. Max stops the car nearby, allowing him and Ori to get out and provide emotional support for the distraught man. Chapter 28 All Guilt for the Wicked Quentin growls as he furiously stomps over, pointing an accusatory finger at the face of his father. Why am I doing this? Why are you doing this? You killed my friends. For no fucking reason other than the family pride. I is that what they are telling you? Cleveland asks, eyes jumping between Six, Max, and Ori. They're lies. I would never do that. I may have threatened you, but to go through with it? On innocent people no less? Fucking liar. Quentin shouts, I know you put a hit on them. He throws a wild hand at Ori's direction. Bring the bag. Ori shrugs, grabbing the bag from the trunk and tossing it at the duo's feet. Quentin, as if he'd already forgotten his initial disgust and distaste for it, rips the bag away and picks up the severed head of Specs by the hair, holding it up for Cleveland to see. This is the guy you spoke to. Isn't IT? He angrily shouts, thrusting the dangling head closer. Isn't IT? He presses, uncaring of the coagulated blood dripping on both of their suits. If Cleveland wasn't shitting himself before, he was now. His son. The dear boy he'd brought up alone was ruthlessly holding the severed head of his enemy, his father's associate. He takes a deep breath and gulps down his saliva, firming his face. I, I did. Quentin stares at him, not expecting the man to just admit it. Why you admit it? He asks, baffled for a moment before shaking his head and unleashing a brutal right hook to the man's face, sending him to the floor with a grunt. Hag, I dash, did. And I do it again? Cleveland spits out before quietly chuckling. They were weak, unmotivated wretches sucking you into a world of drugs, prostitutes, and brain dances. But, he looks up and grins at his son from his knees, you've proven me wrong. You have become as ruthless as I always wanted. Determined. This, here, now, will serve you for the rest of your life. A memory of what happens when you lose your way. Quentin stares at the man, his entire body shaking in rage, his hands trembling with the urge to hit him again and again. This is fucked. Ori remarks to Max who was just watching the whole thing with folded arms. It is, but makes sense. If you ain't willing to stab your own dad in the back with a rusty fork, you won't last a week in high-up corpo life. Might be strange to hear, but there are just as many bodies wearing suits at the bottom of the canal as regular folk. Puts into comparison Ori's own family. They might have been poor, but at least they loved and cared about each other. He couldn't imagine having this kind of relationship with his father. So, what now, son? Will you kill me? Let me go? It's up to you now, Cleveland asks, getting to his feet and brushing off his suit, acting as if he was now in control of the situation. You went through all this trouble, dragging me here and killing my chauffeur. His name was Gerald, by the way. I'm sure his wife and child would appreciate your condolences. Cleveland states dismissively. On the bright side, you've just made room for me to upgrade my security without affording him severance. Jay just shut up. Shut the fuck up. Quentin shouts and begins to pace his finely tailored shoes tapping rhythmically on the concrete floor. Cleveland ignores his command, stepping towards his son. Make a decision, or will you be at my beck and call all your life? Maybe I should find the rest of your friends? The ones who managed to hide away before I caught them dash. Thud. Quentin's fist slams into his father's head for the second time, but he didn't stop there, stepping on top of his body and continually smashing his fist into the man's face. His knuckles quickly became bloody, but the damage he was doing to his father's face was worse. His orbital bone had likely fractured judging by the snap that had echoed around the lot, not to mention his mangled broken nose. Cleveland looks up at his son, breathing heavily and occasionally having to swallow the blood pooling from his mouth and nose. Make. Your. Decision. He rasps out. W.I. Why do you always do this? Even now? You killed my friends. My girlfriend. You want me to make a decision? Fine. Quentin shouts, 
his eyes aglow with mania and malice. He looks to Six and holds out his hand imploringly. I need one of those, he states, gesturing to one of his revolvers. Six shrugs, tossing it to the young adult who scrambles to properly hold it. So Dash, Cleveland starts, but isn't able to get much else out as he unloads all six bullets into his face, splattering the ground around him with an egregious amount of blood. Quentin looks down at his father's corpse, breathing heavily as he looks at his hands. He drops the gun but Six snatches it out of the air, unwilling to let any harm come to it. The young corpo then drops to his knees and lets out a wail, crying into his sleeves as snot and tears pull out. Ori steps forward to go and comfort him, only to be stopped by Max who drops a hand on his shoulder. Don't. Getting attached like this ain't good for Mercs. Besides, you don't want to be anywhere near this if he ever finds out. He states meaningfully. Ori shakes his head. I know what this feels like. It don't mean anything but. No one should have to kill their family. That suit wasn't his family. The folks you're born with? Related by blood? Only get a head start on it. Nah, it's the family you choose that really matters. He focuses on the crying young man. Like his friends were to him. You and I ain't got the right to speak on that. Max says, releasing his grip. Ori lets out a solemn sigh and nods, his heart aching with twinges of guilt. He knew the merc shit wouldn't be moral or good, but he'd never anticipated coming face to face with his own actions. The consequences. Killing was easy, but facing the people left alive that had to deal with it, he felt like he was no better than the scavs that killed his father. He rubs his face and steps over, sitting on his heels next to Quentin despite Max's advice and his own rationale. You know, he said something about hunting down the rest of your friends. That means there's some left alive, right? Chapter 29 Wanting Bats gets home with a groan, stepping into the apartment with his body aching all over. It had been a long day, pawning off the trash that Ori had collected on his recent job after finishing his shift at a shady tech repair shop. Things wouldn't be that bad if that was all, but he'd gotten jumped by someone as he made his way to his apartment, losing basically the entire day's work, including the goodies Ori had found. God he hated this fucking city. He wished he could just go back in time and tell Iman they'd be better off driving into a volcano than settling in this place. Alas, even if such technology existed, it was way out of his hands. He pops a couple painkillers and downs them with some immunoblockers, pills designed to prevent the body from rejecting cyberware, of which he had more than the average person due to his chosen profession as a ripper doc. Then dropping into the dilapidated couch with a tired sigh, turning the TV on just so he wouldn't be stuck there alone in silence. The more he had to think about his and Ori's current situation, the more depressed he'd become. His nephew's mood and attitude worried him since it reminded him of some of his old clients, guys with clear mental illnesses that decided that getting more chrome would be a good substitute for therapy. He only saw them months later, a police report of recent cyberpsycho attacks. He dearly hoped it was just Ori grieving, but the presence of those nanites put him on edge. There weren't any known studies linking nanites to cyberpsychosis since the body couldn't really detect them as it would an altered organ or body part. Bats honestly felt pretty useless. His inability to do anything to help Ori with the nanites or even with Eddie's considering he'd just gotten robbed. If Ori didn't need someone to keep him company, watch his back, and provide advice, he'd have either left Night City already, or jumped from the nearest bridge. Ori couldn't use another Ripper Doc either since they'd probably drug him into a coma and try to sell his body in its entirety with the Nanites. If any corporation found out about them, there was no doubt in his mind that they'd hunt him down with full force. One day at a time, he mutters to himself, it will get better. Click. The door to the apartment opens and Bats stands and reaches for the nearby pistol, just in case the thief had decided to follow him. Thankfully, it was just Ori, his nephew looking at him with weary, eyes that matched the exhaustion of Bats' own. Ori hadn't stopped since Cassinia had been destroyed. The only breaks the kid had taken were when he was getting operated on or reluctantly sleeping. Ori, you alright? He questions, seeing the reflective expression on his face. Y-Gaya. Bats, I'm sorry. Ori quietly offers stepping forward and wrapping the stunned Ripper Doc in a hug. W, what's this for, kid? Nothing. Just felt like saying, thanks for being here, Bats. The Ripper Doc lets out a restrained breath and slowly nods, reciprocating the hug. Yeah, no problem. We're good? Ori almost whispers. We're good. Everything's good. Everything'll be fine. Later, once Ori had calmed down Bats' glances over at him from the other side of the couch. You all right, kid? I mean... We haven't really talked about it, Ksenia. Ori shakes his head. We'll talk about it when we get Cat back. Then just now? Just finished a dash. Difficult job. Had to let some things out. Ori, Max, and Six had to leave Quentin in the car park, tied to a chair next to the corpse's dad. They made the whole thing look like a kidnapping gone wrong, which should hopefully stop Quentin from being seen as complicit. He'd had a chat with the guy, and while he didn't regret it, he felt far, far worse after everything he'd done. 
Quentin's suffering was almost wholly at Ori's hands. Yet the guy didn't even know about it, and was confiding in him, the murderer. Bat slowly nods. He wasn't an edge runner, but most folks in Night City knew generally what they were about. He decides to not worry the kid about him getting jumped earlier. He definitely didn't need the stress. Instead, he tosses a shard over at him. Clep this from the tech repair shop. Got anti-privacy software on it. Basically means your face will be blurred to most cameras. Things a little faulty though. So a good net runner may be able to get through it. I'd keep that scov mask of yours on if I were you. Thanks. You checked it for viruses? Obviously. Bat shrugs. Ori nod and slots it in behind his ear, his vision buzzing as it shows a filling bar indicating the software download. Got it. You got any more jobs? How much your last one pay anyway? Bats inquires. 15,000. I ain't got it yet, but it should be coming soon enough. Ori states. F-15K? Bats stutters out. What the fuck did you do that was worth that much? You don't want to know. Ori sharply answers, unwilling to talk about it. That's a lot. I mean big time. Do all mercs make that amount? Or shrewds. Do no. Just know that I'm not doing a job like that again in a while, if I can help it. With all that I should have. 23,000? Think that's enough to hire someone to find Kat? With how little info we have on her. I doubt it. I don't know much about this kind of thing though. So maybe it is? HM. I'll talk to some people. See what the rates are. As for if I've got any more jobs? Not right now, my fixer. Got in over his head. Or he pauses. Hey, can we do some more checks? You know, about the Nainites. He asks, wanting to double check if there was a possibility of them completely taking him over. Bats nods. Sure. We can make it a weekly thing if you want, to be certain. Chapter 30. Anatomical Arrangements. A week passes with little happening. With Specs out of the picture Ori was forced to ask Judy for another fixer, which was pretty difficult considering what happened to his last one. Even if the crime was never pinned on him, the mere fact that he was Specs' last contact was a big red flag for most. Thankfully, Max and Six allowed him to continue working with them, for the time being at least. He'd take a smaller cut, but that was fair considering his lack of experience compared to the two, along with his lesser capabilities. Their jobs mainly consisted of protection for drug deals, clearing out scavs and squatters for property owners, even providing makeshift security guards for clubs or VIPs who'd required it at the last minute. He'd only been in one shootout, even taking no injuries in the process, which was a plus. The rest went ahead as usual. No inconveniences like hat specs had tossed at him. This allowed him to build up enough of his dense fat, vitamin, protein, and mineral reserves for the Nainites to finally make their first significant upgrade to his body. The first was to his bone marrow. He didn't really understand the technical babble the Nainites or even bats tried to explain to him. But basically, they'd increase the production of red blood cells while decreasing the production of white blood cells. This wasn't really a problem given that the Nainites could target and eradicate any bacteria, virus, parasite, etc. that tried to invade his body. His immune system was of little use when they were present, especially now that they'd vastly increased their own numbers via self-replication. The billions of Nainites had turned into trillions. This may have started to obstruct his bodily systems if they weren't each individually microscopic, smaller than blood cells actually. Their increased numbers massive enhanced Ori's healing capabilities. A small cut was almost instantly healed, while a bullet wound took seconds or minutes depending on its severity. Ori's only real worry now was getting shot in the head, or his heart. Speaking of which, due to the increased number of red blood cells, his blood had become much thicker, almost viscous in fact, which leads to the next upgrade the Nainites had to make. His heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Each needed to be strengthened to handle the increased blood pressure caused by the thickened blood. Bats was surprised by the sheer efficiency of it all. The Nainites had expertly planned the entire thing out and did so categorically, without issue. If someone were to make an incision into one of Ori's arteries now, only a few spurts of high-pressure blood would make it out before coagulants sealed the wound back up, all without the Nainites' intervention. It was a medical marvel, something that could only be matched by quality cyberware. With these upgrades, Ori's endurance had been massively enhanced. While his muscles weren't yet at that level, he'd almost never get breath again. His resting heart rate was 10 BPM, something that was only really matched by creatures in the animal kingdom. It could even go lower, but that was only when Ori's lungs were upgraded, which were planned to be the next thing to receive an upgrade. It was actually kind of weird for Ori to feel his new powerful heart beating in his chest like a drum. It felt almost out of place, like someone had taken it out, forced it to bench press for a year straight then shoved it back in. When Bats checked his heart rate his hand was visibly moving with each pulse. Of course, all of this came at a cost. His dietary requirements had increased rather drastically, requiring far more vitamins, minerals, and protein than before. The blood production of his bone marrow doubled his required iron intake. Bats suggested getting various cyberware to assist with this, but it was actually the Nainites who objected. The systems controlling the cyberware may conflict with their own programming, 
since they were already malfunctioning as it is, it might actually be dangerous to introduce anything else. Thankfully, there was another option available to them. Acquiring the NMN injector and using it to have the Nanites assimilate various technology. Though, they'd first need to integrate some sort of tech that'd grant them the ability to break down and refine metals and other sturdy materials. As they are now, they could only process the iron and other minerals that were digested by Ori's own body, which obviously wouldn't work externally. Bat suggested various microscopic heat generators, conduction cores, and other things, but he and the Nanites eventually agreed on one thing an attachment for the Gorilla Arm cyberware called thermal knuckles that had specialized microcapacitors and insulated conductors which the Nanites may be able to integrate into their own design. If this was actually the case, the Nanites would be able to dissimilate actual materials, and when combined with the NMN injector, deconstruct tech to integrate into Ori, all using the body's resources which would likely stave off any chance of him going cyberpsycho. That wasn't the only use however, if this was possible, Ori would literally possess a one-hit kill move by infecting an enemy with Nanites, allowing the tiny robots to devour them completely, regardless of whatever defenses that may have. Bats also introduced another avenue of research, the animal kingdom. Did you know a fascinating fact? Chimps on average were four times stronger than a human with similar weight. This was mainly due to the type of muscles they had, which drastically lowered their general dexterity but massively enhanced their speed and strength. There were other examples like exoskeletons that seemed to interest the Nanites, but Ori outright refused anything that might alter his human appearance. After all, he couldn't very well live in society looking like a giant insect person, even if he was made virtually indestructible. He'd settle for carbon nanotube, weaving under his skin for defense. Apparently, this material would make him bulletproof against all but the most powerful weapons. The Nanites also request permission to begin making upgrades to his brain, but he unilaterally refused. His loss of control against Toxine made him well aware of the dangers the Nanites presented. Should they choose, they could take him over with ease, and no one would be able to do anything about it. For now though, he was satisfied with his current upgrades. Digestive system, fat energy storage, bone marrow, heart, and blood vessels. Soon he'd be able to move on to bigger, better improvements 